Uh, good afternoon, or uh, as they say in Japan, from which I've just returned, konnichiwa. Um, it's a pleasure. I'm, I'm um, Bob Lieber. I, I'm a professor in the government department in the School of Foreign Service, and I um, chair the executive committee of the um, Program for Jewish Civilization. On behalf of the program, um, its director, Jacques Berliner Blau, its uh, deputy director, Melissa Spence, um, and the uh, staff. I'm uh, delighted to welcome you all for what I think will be an excellent talk. Um, I think we may also have a couple of some visitors here from the um, SFS program in Qatar. Are, are any of you here? No? Um, before I introduce our speaker, let me mention two other events. Today is a, uh, a big day for people talking about, and people who really know their subject, talking about um, the subject of Israel uh, and its neighbors and the peace process uh, and related topics. Um, this afternoon at 5 p.m., um, this year's uh, visiting Goldman Israeli professor, Professor Yossi Navo of Haifa University, will be speaking in the Riggs Library, uh, giving the annual Goldman Professor Lecture. His topic will be Jordan-Israeli Peace, Model or Exception. I think it's an important talk, not least because he really knows his subject, but also because the, um, the successful cases of Israeli, Jordan, Israeli, Egyptian peacemaking may suggest what aspects of that process um, are uh, uh, models or examples for the future and what other aspects may be unique or uh, not as useful or relevant. Then at, so that's uh, in the Riggs Library in the Healy Building at 5 o'clock, followed by a reception. Nobody ever said there was an absence of free food at Georgetown. <laughs> then at 7 p.m., the Institute for International Law and Politics, which is a master's degree program, um, has a, a talk that's open to all. Uh, uh, it's given by Daniel Taub, who is the principal deputy legal advisor in Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and his topic will be the role of international law in foreign policy decision making. That's at 7 p.m. in room 450 of the Intercultural Center. Um, to introduce um, our speaker, Scott Lesensky, let me note that uh, he is, uh, at, as uh, you'll know from our announcement, uh, he is uh, a leader of a U.S. Institute of Peace study of Arab-Israeli peace negotiations since 1991, uh, and they focus on the American peacemaking efforts and the role of outside parties. He will uh, obviously say more about that uh, in his in his talk. Um, Scott um, focuses himself on issues relating to the Middle East and U.S. foreign policy toward the region. He has lectured and written extensively on the Arab-Israeli conflict and America's role in the Middle East. He is, uh, has been a member of the U.S. Institute of Peace staff since 2004, and um, he directs the, uh, the Institute's initiative on Iraq and its neighbors, as well as co-directing uh, the study group I referred to on Arab-Israeli peacemaking, uh, an effort that is chaired by Ambassador Daniel Kurtzer, and Dan, if I'm not mistaken, has been ambassador both to Israel and to Egypt. Um, Scott uh, is also, I'm pleased to say, uh, has been an adjunct assistant professor here at Georgetown through the Program for Jewish Civilization, and most recently taught a course on Israeli society and politics last semester. In addition, he has been a visiting assistant professor of international relations at Mount Holyoke and a fellow of the Council on Foreign Relations in New York and the Brookings Institution here in Washington. He frequently comments on radio and television in America, Europe, and the Middle East, and um, is a recipient of the Yitzhak Rabin Shimon Peres Peace Award from Tel Aviv University in 1999. He's a graduate of UCLA for his under undergraduate degree and earned his PhD at Brandeis. It's a great pleasure to introduce Scott Lesansky. I asked Bob to do the short introduction, so I appreciate that he abided by my uh, requests. 
the year I had at Brooklyn's was a terrific year for a lot of reasons, partly because I shared a certain corner in the third floor of that building with uh, Professor Lieber's uh, son, Kier, who teaches at Notre Dame now. So we have all sorts of uh, connections. Um, Bob mentioned the Iraq and its Neighbors project that I'm working on at the Institute as well, and I mention only because if I seem scattered, uh, like a lot of people in Washington, it's because of that particular project. Uh, the Institute is engaged in not just research, but dialogue, promoting dialogue between Iraqis and their neighbors. And we've got a meeting in a few days with, with all seven countries in Turkey, so I'm ahead of them. And then in that, of course, Melissa strong-armed me a few months ago to put this on the calendar, and I was delighted to do it. So let me, um, that's just the caveat, the disclaimer, that I see you know, confused and um, uh, distracted. Let me, um, like Bob, I have to say a few words of introduction. First, uh, my thanks to the program on Jewish civilization, which not only has these terrific uh, banners, but uh, uh, they've got their act together on the banners, but they uh, were very kind and generous, and I like to think they had their act together and giving me a chance uh, to teach. I had a terrific time last semester teaching. Some students are here today. Uh, my thanks to Jacques Rotterblau, uh, who's the chair of the program, and Bob and Melissa Spence. Uh, this, actually, I looked at the invitation, it reminded me of, like, if you go to a school in Ramallah, or you go to a university building in Jerusalem, and, you, and it's hard to find the name, unlike here, it's hard to find the name of the building because there's so many people listed as the sponsors and donors. And, you know, if, it's, if you're in Ramallah, it's, you know, the Norwegian Department of this and the UN of that. So this program, I think, is uh, co-sponsored by three different groups on campus. Uh, one of them is the um, program that produces the Master's Students in Arab Studies, uh, okay. the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies. I think they're a co-sponsor, so I, I claim a certain allegiance to them only because I now employ three members, uh, three graduates of the program. Uh, none of them could be here today because I have them working so hard at the Institute of Peace. Um, but I mentioned the names, because some of you may know them. Hisham Salam, Robert Grace, um, the current student, uh, Jamie Arnett, and Sam Parker. Jamie is the research assistant on this particular project. Let me say a little bit about it. Um, what are we doing? What's this, the, the study group on Arab-Israeli? peacemaking at the Institute of Peace. Well, uh, this particular uh, document, not very fancy looking, doesn't have color photos and all, but you can get it in the Georgetown Library, and it's in most libraries in this country. It's now out of print. This is a study that was produced by Samuel Lewis, who was a former American ambassador, a very distinguished former American diplomat. Uh, many of you may know him, Sam Lewis. Uh, he was president of the Institute of Peace at this time. He was on the eve, after the first Gulf War, on the eve of the Madrid Peace Summit. He joined up with uh, Ken Stein, who teaches at Emory University. Some of you may know him. They gathered a study group of outside experts, and people, and you know, former and current officials, and they produced this uh, sort of dispassionate, uh, functionally oriented, lessons learned study on American peacemaking efforts. At that point, you know, there had been, as they called it, 50 years. Uh, and we were heading into a new phase, and they wanted to distill, not a chronology, not, a, not, not the account divine, you know, from above, from the heavens, but a very dispassionate uh, study, lessons learned, a guidebook, and you can't put this in your pocket. I don't know if we'll produce ours like this, and you could, you know, put it in the coat pocket, but, you know, the idea, first and foremost, is that it's a guidebook for American negotiators, and then you work outward in sort of concentric circles. The next one is that you're hoping to inform people that are interested and that work on this issue throughout the US government, the Congress, other outside parties, and then ultimately trying to affect public discourse on this issue. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here today. So why do I mention this study? Well, this study was produced in 1990, uh, 91, I forget. Um, and we decided at the Institute that there's good reason to revisit a lot of these issues. Why? Well, number one, a lot of time has passed. Uh, and the Middle East and the whole Arab-Israeli set of relationships is quite different than it was uh, back then. Uh, the international system has changed uh, a lot. So a lot of time has passed, and I think we need to revisit. Uh, there were also a couple of gaps here. These, the methodology of this report, they didn't speak to anyone in the region. They didn't interview with former negotiators. They didn't treat the issue of the big elephant in the room, the issue of domestic politics, American domestic politics, full of interest groups and things. So we wanted to update the study, we want to expand its parameters a little bit. Uh, why else are we doing this? Well, there's what you might call a Rashomon problem. Not Rashomon, but what is that? It's that, some of you may know, very well known uh, uh, Japanese film. Of course, I, like most uh, intellectuals or aspiring intellectuals, when I heard someone reference this, it was like two years ago, I just sort of nodded and then ran back to the office and Googled it. So it's this <laughs> Japanese movie where everyone, would, so tell anyone who saw it, well, I'm sure that half this room probably saw the movie, tell me if I got it wrong. Everyone witnesses a murder, 
crime, and yet all the accounts are different. They witnessed the same event, and yet all the accounts are different. So what has happened here? Reason number two, why do we do this? Why do we feel it's important um, at, at USFP to do this? Well, anyone you know, who's been awake in the last six years know that as the Arab Israeli, particularly the Israeli-Palestinian peace process has spiraled out of control and has collapsed, causing you know, mayhem, maybe not as great as Iraq, but terrible mayhem for Israelis, Palestinians, and all the neighbors, the accounts of the players are, um, are, are, are far apart, are very far apart. The accounts of American officials are very far apart. In fact, some of those accounts from the same people have even changed over time. <coughs> so, and it may sound kind of, you know, like, you know, who do we think we are, but we felt there's a need to try to sort <coughs> some of those accounts as well, and to sort out, and not to do it in terms of a memoir or a chronology, a narrative, to tackle some of these issues in a thematic way. How does the U.S. organize its diplomacy? What's the role of the president, envoys? How do we work with other neighbors? And then the, 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 the more concrete issues of mediation, what's our role? What role do we play? What tools of diplomacy do we use? Um, and then third, third reason we're doing this, this is kind of a tee up, because uh, it's important to understand why, we're, why I'm doing this, and it gives an insight into some of the conclusions as well. Our central framing questions, we don't just want to bring up an old study and bring it up to date. We don't just want to try to square these narratives. Uh, Ambassador Kurtzer, myself, and the three other members of the study group, we're a study group of five, uh, William Quant, University of Virginia, Stephen Spiegel from UCLA, and Shibley Tahan, right here in Washington, at Maryland and Brookings. Um, our feeling is that given uh, the strategic environment that the U.S. faced at the end of the Cold War, that internationally, in the Middle East, if you take that and you fast forward 17 years, it's rather astounding how little the United States has accomplished. Uh, given, you don't think about the U.S. position today, which is very much an imperiled position, an American position in the region where our power and our influence are unfortunately diverging, that's a whole other subject, but at the beginning of the period we're studying, the U.S. was the preeminent power in the region. The U.S. had also come off of a generation of very successful diplomacy, Arab Israeli diplomacy, so we felt it was important, and here I have two, two, two of the members of the study group are themselves former diplomats, and, uh, and are you know, willing and and eager to be introspective and ask that hard question. Why did the United States accomplish so little? So little of sustaining value in the last um, uh, 15 or so odd years. So that's what it's all about. It's what of the composition of the group. What's our methodology? It's very old school. Uh, we're not crunching numbers. We've sat down, we've interviewed about 50 former negotiators and policymakers over the last uh, five months. We've gone to the Middle East. We've met uh, Syrians, Egyptians, Jordanians, Palestinians. Um, uh, Israelis, we've talked to people at the highest levels, we've talked to people outside of government too, because there's certainly, uh, it's certainly important to talk to people in civil society and on the outside as well, opinion shapers. Um, but we've done a lot of interviews, uh, we've got the accounts of some of the study group members themselves, uh, others who weren't active players have done a lot of work on the issue, uh, including my own little small slice of research I've done, I brought a couple articles here that I've done on the foreign aid dimension, what, what have we gotten from all the foreign aid we provide, what kind of... Uh, you know, payback do we get from the large amounts of foreign aid we've used in this particular process. So that's our methodology. What are our products? Well, I had thought when I told Melissa, uh, and I was so eager to accept a few months ago, we had expected to have a report similar to this one around this time. We're a few months behind, so what you're getting is what you might call an early harvest. Uh, my own idea is that's the caveat. These are my own conclusions. We're not speaking for the study group. Um, but I'll give you a little bit, a little flavor. In fact, this is probably more beneficial to me than to you because it forced me to sit down and start collecting some of the lessons learned. Uh, so when we sit down later in the spring to write, um, I'll get a little bit of a head start. We're going to have a product similar to this first report, the Lewis Stein report. Short, very short monograph, um, maybe shorter than a monograph, longer than, than, a, than a book chapter, uh, which is organized, as I said, thematically, answering some of these questions about the process and about mediation. Uh, but we're also going to have a second publication, uh, which is going to come out probably a year from now, because we feel we've gathered a lot of material. We're going to have a second publication that addresses what we call pivotal points in the process. It's kind of hard to say with all those P's. Pivotal points in the process. Uh, moments when, when opportunities and windows of opportunity seem to open, but then shut very quickly. And we feel it's a fair question. The U.S. isn't always uh, the essential critical element, whether there's success or failure. But we're a big player, we've got a lot of weight, and it's worthwhile to, to go over pivotal points. The, uh, uh, the initial Oslo agreements in the early 90s, the failed Israeli-Syrian negotiations, the failed negotiations at Camp David, why the uh, Israeli um, 
why this confluence of Israeli disengagement from Gaza and the death of Arafat and a number of factors, why wasn't that sort of pushed a little bit further given the engagement of the United States? There's a few pivotal moments, so stay tuned. That'll take, um, that's going to take a little more time. Here's how I want to organize. I'm just going to give you a couple of sets of comments, lessons learned. First about mediation, and second about process. Um, um, first about uh, mediation. Um, and here I try to use some of the language of the uh, of our. If you know Sam Lewis, does anybody know this Sam Lewis in this room? Uh, actually, a descendant I only learned recently of Meriwether Lewis, same family, Lewis and Clark. Um, he has. They're probably the smartest guy in the room most of the time, but it has a folksy manner. It has a very folksy manner. And this report was written in a folksy way. So let me begin the lessons, um, seven lessons on, uh, on mediation. <clears throat> the first one um, about the, the parameters of the U.S. role. Be selective and be flexible in choosing a role that fits the situation you're in. Uh, the U.S. and the Arab-Israeli realm has to play many different roles. We've got to be facilitator or stage manager. We've got to be mediator. Sometimes banging the, the parties, banging their heads together. We've got to be an arbitrator. There are times, and I'll talk about some of those cases, sometimes when we should have been an arbitrator when we weren't, others when we tried to arbitrate, well, we need to actually put forward our positions because the parties are this close but can't actually meet. And in fact, putting forward our own position often unleashes all kinds of opportunities on the side. Now, I'll talk about that in a little bit more, but we've got to be facilitator, we've got to be arbitrator. Uh, we've got to be a mediator. Sometimes we have to set rules. Sometimes we have to be what I would call the rule maker. Uh, in moments, particularly like today, when there are no agreements, for example, between Israelis and Palestinians, no rules of the road, um, it's what Dennis Ross would call the paradox of American involvement. He talks about this in his book. Um, uh, when, they, when they're talking to each other, they need us the least. When they're the furthest apart, that's when our role becomes most important. But the paradox is it's, it's very hard to, to capture anything beneficial in those moments. But uh, you need to be selective and you need to be uh, flexible. Uh, and something we'll get into, I won't get into great detail now, but what we're going to get into in the report is that there have been moments where American negotiators come in with a frame of mind uh, that they're, uh, they've learned lessons from, let's say, Israeli-Egyptian peacemaking and how you get these two strong regional powers to make peace and what the U.S. role should be, whether it's to underwrite or mediate. Um, and they've applied those in settings where it's not appropriate, in particular the Israeli-Palestinian circumstance, where uh, it's a very different a strategic environment and a very different array of, 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 of power attributes between the parties. Um, what's needed at one moment in the process, for example, when the Oslo Agreement is first signed right here on the White House lawn, September 13th, 1993, when the U.S. really just has to do follow-through and, and, and play its role as an underwriter, or what you might call a lead underwriter, like on Wall Street, we're the big bank, and you get other people together and you fund this great experiment which Israelis and Palestinians came up to on their own, that role needs to change. In the mid-1990s, when the process fell apart, we either let it fall apart, or we need to come in with a much stronger role. The parameters of our role as third party need to change, or else it falls apart. And I would argue they need to change in the direction of, of arbitrating, of putting forward uh, uh, American positions on certain key issues, uh, which we did, but we did, we did far too late. And I'm not going to say it's going to be in a study, but I suspect we're going to move in that direction. We came to the role of arbitration. It really started with President Clinton at the Y Summit, 1998. The process was well imperiled by then. Um, so be selective and be flexible when, when you choose the role, uh, uh, your role as the third party. Uh, the second lesson is on the toolbox, um, uh, the diplomatic toolbox that you know diplomats, negotiators carry around with them. Don't abuse the tools. That's you know, we use again the Sam Lewis folksy. Don't abuse the tools. Let me give you two examples, one on symmetry and one on foreign aid. Uh, and these are just two examples. We don't have a lot of time. There's all kinds of tools, you know, uh, uh, diplomats carry around with them, uh, uh, the power of, of the podium, and there's um, the role of intelligence, and uh, it's not just symmetry and foreign aid. There's all sorts of tricks up the sleeves of a negotiator, but symmetry. Symmetry, ideally, and, and many of these lessons I'm going to talk about aren't only applicable in the Arab-Israeli realm. Some are, some are general rules. Uh, symmetry is one of them. Symmetry needs to be used to get you past the final yard. To get you, to, I hate sports metaphors, so I don't know anything about sports, but to get you in the end zone. Uh, it's, they're not to be used for a Hail Mary. Uh, at the time, in the summer of 2000, a lot of people were convinced, as I, as I was that summer, watching from the outside, Democrats and Republicans, supporters of Israel and people who don't support Israel, wow, maybe it's important. And the Clinton administration said, well, time's ticking, the parties are going to fall apart, we've got to try one last chance. 
Well, you know, symmetry at a certain moment in the process can be damaging if it, if it, if it comes out an abject failure. And also, if certain parties break the rules and, and the blame game begins, uh, that summit, um, in retrospect now, uh, uh, and even some of the insiders agree, uh, probably did more damage uh, than good. So, so summits aren't only for the Hail Mary, the past here in the Georgetown making sports and maybe religious references anyway. Um, but they're also not for photo ops. And here, here's the fault of the Bush administration. They've shown up at an organized summits, important summits, where the leaders, and you can't get memory. You don't go above in diplomacy. When you hit the leaders together, that's it. So you've got to use that moment for something very uh, durable and something that is sustainable. So there have been summits like one in Aqaba in Jordan that President Bush presided over and then promised to sort of ride herd is the expression he used. And yet the U.S. Uh, walked away from the process and um, treated it more as a photo op. So summits, you've got to be very careful how you use summits. Summits raise expectations. Um, and here I'll depart from a generalist um, argument because in the Arab-Israeli realm, you know, these guys and women, uh, they're used to summits. Uh, there was a Camp David summit in the summer of, uh, in the fall of 1978. I mean, this is, this is a conflict that is, you know, seen at summits and they sort of, they know a summit uh, and, they know, and they know they don't have a summit. So you, you got to be careful how you use them. There's a lot of memory in this conflict. Um, second, the issue of foreign aid, or broadly what you might call what I call economic, in my writings, economic inducements. Because these days, it's not just aid. In the old days, you'd write checks to Israelis, Palestinians, you know, whoever. These days, it's much more free trade agreements, um, uh, development banks, all kinds of promises of economic goodies that go beyond just you know, sending uh, checks for foreign aid. So initially, in the, at least in the Arab-Israeli setting, foreign aid um, has been incredibly, I argue, incredibly successful throughout the whole period of Egyptian-Israeli negotiations in the 70s and through the Israeli-Jordanian agreement. Um, I haven't talked about this with Professor Neva, I look forward to that. Um, even in the Israeli-Syrian context, people don't realize that Syria was a very large recipient of USA in the 70s, $100 million a year, helped to cement the disengagement agreement, an important agreement between Syria and Israel. But, and I don't want to get too bogged down in the details, but for some reason, and, for, and it's an unfortunate reason, that foreign aid has become now less an instrument for pushing the process forward and for sustaining agreements, and it's become what I would call just another attribute, just another trait in what's a rather um, uh, ugly status quo. Uh, it has become something that uh, facilitates and gives um, Israel yet, yet another reason not to confront what is essentially an internal Israeli issue about settlement building, an issue that is so, and here I look at one of my students, because we talked about it in class, this time, it's so wrapped up in all kinds of internal political dynamics, but Israelis can't unlock it for, for uh, political, psychological reasons, for institutional, for all sorts of reasons, they can't unlock that settlement conundrum. Uh, the U.S. has a lot of uh, influence and, and an ability to do it. We did it once in the early 90s. Um, but these days, the way our foreign aid is structured, uh, it has reinforced and has made that problem all the harder. Uh, Palestinian institution building, foreign aid has probably done more to harm uh, good governance um, uh, than, uh, than to help it. So foreign aid, unfortunately, uh, used to be a lot, used to look at and say, wow, this is a huge line item in the U.S. foreign aid in the, in the pie, 40% at one point in the mid-90s, with Iraq, Afghanistan, somehow the Arab-Israeli thing looks like it's, you know, we get, we, we, you know, we get things on the cheap. But it's still a significant amount of money, and it's one of our instruments, and we need to find better ways to use it more effectively. You need sunset provisions. Foreign aid has shelf life. As you, you know, as, it, as you go out over time, which, what you gain in influence today, 10 years from now, you won't gain. And the parties understand that. You need sunset provisions. You need more conditionality. You need all kinds of things, uh, and I can go on and on on this one, that we don't see when it comes to uh, foreign aid that we provide to Israel and its neighbors uh, today. So there's a lot that can be improved in terms of uh, the toolbox. Don't abuse tools. Um, the three, in terms of mediation, here I speak to the U.S.-Israel special relationship. Uh, I'm trying to try again to I can't, I can't do it because Sam has this, like, sort of folks, if you know him, of talking, I can't do the delivery. But number three, uh, Israel, because we have a special relationship, it's okay if they drive the process, but you can't let them steer. If you chart the U.S.-Israel special relationship, and I don't mean it in a broad sense, in the very narrow sense of how it exists in negotiations, which is since the mid-70s, as Israel and Egypt were trying to talk peace, the U.S. and Israel created a very close relationship when it came to negotiations. And we concluded all kinds of 
at the time, secret agreements to coordinate and to talk and so that the Israelis would be reassured that they would, as one Israeli negotiator told me, that we could walk down, we could open a door and walk down this long, dark hallway not knowing where it led. Uh, we needed certain assurances. And one of those assurances was to coordinate and that the U.S. Uh, would, would tell Israel uh, when we'd take positions and when we wouldn't. Um, but what's happened is that our, our, um, our willingness and our eagerness, in fact, in the, early, in the mid to late 70s to notify Israel and to talk and exchange information and coordinate um, in the pre-negotiation and the negotiation period later became what you might call pre-clearing at the time of the Madrid Peace Conference, actually making sure the Israelis approved of positions beforehand to at the very end, at least of the 90s in the Clinton administration, and some would argue, I might even argue, into the Bush administration, from, going from notifying to pre-clearing to here I'm using all kinds of State Department words, to letting Israel task us. And here, I'm not offering a, a, a new and novel argument. Uh, Aaron Miller, who's a former American negotiator, some of you know, uh, put it very bluntly, got into some political hot water a year or two ago. He wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post about being Israel's lawyer. Um, uh, uh, with Edward Barak at the Sharm el-Sheikh uh, Agreement in 1999, when we bought into his rationale for renegotiating agreements that Israel and the Palestinians had agreed that the U.S. had ratified. We bought in and allowed him to dictate the renegotiation of those agreements. We took uh, Israeli positions uh, uh, at Geneva when we tried to broker an agreement with Syria. We literally just took the Israeli position and handed it over, meaning the third party became more of a messenger uh, than a mediator. And I would even argue, and here, again, I don't speak for our study group, but even into the Bush administration, uh, this current administration, with the Israeli uh, plan to disengage from Gaza, we put our own initiative, the roadmap, on hold, embraced the Israeli initiative, uh, even offered them certain assurances they wanted, both public and private, and yet we, we then sort of left the scene and didn't use, uh, uh, we didn't use that opportunity to move, to re-engage re, uh, the party. So it's sort of being tasked by one of the parties, even if it's a close ally, uh, is not a position you want to be in as an outside party. It just isn't. A fourth I would say you've got to address the asymmetry of power between Israelis and Palestinians. And it's to the benefit of both. And here you get back into the mindset. And people learn, I think it's Ernie May at, um, at Harvard uh, and others who have written about you know, how politicians and policymakers often learn through history and they draw lessons through history. Well, a lot of negotiators who worked with Israel and its neighboring Arab states have always looked through the prism of these highly successful negotiations in the 70s uh, with Israel and Egypt. Um, in that sort of period, but in the past, as I alluded to before, in the Palestinian context, it doesn't work well. An effective me mediator can only be effective if you address the asymmetries uh, and you try to provide not a balance of power, but you, you find a way so that each party can find a pathway uh, to what it needs to have uh, and also to the assurances it needs. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, it means very specific things. For example, it would be in the U.S. interest as a mediator, as a third party, to define what it sees as the final status uh, of an agreement between Israelis and Palestinians. And let that just sit there for a while. Don't take it off the table the way President Clinton did, uh, but we need to have clarity on that. That helps to partly address the asymmetry of power. We need more conditionality on foreign aid, and it's not with Israel. I'm, not, that's not, I'm, I'm talking about both parties. Because hard and fast conditionality hasn't existed for, for the most part. We need to monitor, and we need to monitor with consequences. We also need to factor in, and here it dovetails with the narrative that came out of the Camp David story somewhere in 2000, we need to factor in for Palestinians the need for regional support. Um, uh, and here it's a controversial point. Some will say, well, they use it as an excuse to avoid uh, uh, hard bargaining and concessions. But I, you know, I think it's the consensus of our own study group with a lot of people on the outside that Palestinians, unlike Egyptians and unlike Syrians, that need regional support mechanisms uh, for when they make concessions on big issues, big issues that often resonate beyond um, beyond their, their small uh, patch of territory. Uh, a fifth, I would say, fifth, fifth lesson uh, for, the, for, the, for the mediator when you're at the table. Uh, always remember to strike a good balance between governance and peacemaking. Between institution building and peacemaking. Uh, and I'll be very quick on this point. In the 1990s, we made a real mistake by putting Palestinian institution building on the back burner. Sometimes it was even at Israel's behest and putting peacemaking and moving the process forward in the, in the foreground. Um, and then 
after the year 2000, in these last uh, six or seven years under the Bush administration, we've then done the opposite. We've put institution building and governance and um, that whole host of issues far ahead of peacemaking. And we've gone, I think, too far in the other direction. We need to find a good balance. Uh, institution building and transparency and good governance and everything that we certainly should expect as an outside party who's also funding and subsidizing and underwriting this process can't be used as a bludgeon, but it also can't be forgotten. So you got to strike. A good negotiator will strike a, a, a fine balance between the two. Um, and last, maybe it's only six lessons, not seven. I'm losing count. If you're taking notes, you can remind me. Um, the last point, six. Okay, so here we are, number six. Bob's always taking notes. Um, on peace building, what we call at the Institute and in the field peace building, or people to people initiatives. Well, here I have to just try to stay tuned, because we're still doing a lot of interviews, <coughs> still doing a lot of thinking, but there's, there's a school of belief uh, out there, and some of it begins with President Clinton himself, uh, his own mea culpa uh, when he left office. He spoke, he doesn't speak so much these days, but in the first few months, he and some of his negotiators said a lot about how they neglected this issue of peace building. Uh, and people to people initiatives, and how they felt far too cloistered at the table, striking deals. Sometimes they couldn't even strike, strike deals, but striking deals that were detached from the kind of um, uh, structure you need in civil society that can support agreements. Um, we need to do a little bit more thinking on it, but I sort of just throw it out there without a real hard and fast conclusion. It's something to consider. Um, something to consider. That's sort of the media. That's, that's you know, when you're at the table, that's for the negotiator. Let me say a few words about process. And this is, you know, maybe it's just because, you know, here we're in Washington, I work in Washington, most of the negotiators live in Washington. So you got to talk about, everyone's talking about process, you know, how the U.S. government is organized, how we organize our diplomacy. And I, th I think it's a fair point. I'll, I'll speak about just um, the four, um, four short lessons. Um, first, the critical role of presidents. These parties, as I alluded to before, they're quite accustomed to a high level of involvement by the U.S. president, by the Secretary of State. And they know an engaged president when they see one, and they know one uh, who's not watching. Um, that's, I'm not making a judgment call, I'm not making a normative argument about that. I'm just saying it's a fact. 35 years into intensive American engagement, that they're used to it. So it's very, it's very important that, um, uh, that the president here, little old me, speak to the president. The president of the United States needs to send the right signal to the parties from day one when you enter the Oval Office. I know there's all kinds of things, so I'm not going to draw comparisons and weight this to the rest of foreign policy and all the domestic issues. But uh, if you care about this issue, uh, presidents need to send a signal in here. Uh, in terms of the Bush administration, I would say they sent the wrong signal on day one that they were going to disengage. And they may not have understood how the parties would interpret that, um, but that's the signal they sent. And I think it will, probably wasn't the most helpful one. So there's a critical role for American presidents. They don't have to manage the issue every day, and they don't have to end up being the desk officer, which is somehow what President Clinton became. Um, but they've got to send the right signals. Number two, envoys. And here, don't make a judgment call. Uh, it's not whether you have an envoy, it's not should we have an envoy, it's not, well, all we need is envoy. That's often what you hear. All we need is envoy. It's not whether, but how. Don't be fooled, the envoy is not the goal, the envoy, you know, and I think it's um, self-evident, but, you know, the conversation in Washington is all, often about, we need an envoy, we don't need an envoy. Um, envoy, obviously, is an instrument. Um, What's the comparative advantage of an envoy? And here, it's no different for a lot of other cases, the Balkans, Afghanistan, elsewhere. An envoy provides a focal point for the parties, it provides a focal point for the U.S. government. Our government is vast, it's a vast array, and on the, these issues, like other uh, regional conflicts, a lot of elements of the government are brought in, intelligence, defense, and particularly more and more trade, and the Treasury Department. Um, so it's a focal point also for the interagency of the U.S. government. Uh, an envoy is important for ideas. And here I'll, I'll talk about, in one of the next lessons, about the fast pace of diplomacy and how the sort of what next uh, and all those sort of minutia issues usually take hold of our diplomats from day to day. Where is the secretary going to visit? And, uh, is is, is you know, Secretary Rice going to stop in Egypt before going to Israel? And sort of at the end of the day, you have no ideas, you have no strategic thinking. So an envoy can provide a hub for generating ideas, generating new thinking. And then, of course, the standard reason why you have an envoy because President or Secretary of State can't manage the issue day to day, so you need an envoy as a standard for policymakers. Here are just a few lessons, and these are all pretty general. But what makes an envoy successful, particularly what makes an envoy successful in the Arab Israeli context? Um, and there's certainly plenty to talk about and plenty to draw from here because there's been a lot of envoys. Um, I'll give you four things the envoy needs um, preliminary list. Number one, an envoy needs a blessing. 
uh, needs to be blessed by the top decision makers, by the White House, by the Secretary of State. Uh, and if you're not, if you don't go out to the Middle East, uh, and here I'm sort of thinking about um, uh, one of the, I won't say who, but one of our people we interviewed, a former Secretary of State, said, if you don't have that, you will walk, you will go there, and you will be eaten alive. Uh, by these parties, they can sort of, they can smell, they can sense. If there's any light between the envoy and the administration that the envoy represents, you know, you're done. That's it. Uh, uh, Tony Zinni, former American general, even Jim Wolfenson, former president of the World Bank, who was the m most recent envoy, not only of the U.S., he was actually a quartet envoy. It's another story. Don't worry. They didn't always have it, and there were moments when the parties could see that these envoys, that there was a little, little light between them and those that were interested in the So you've got to have no light. The envoy has to have um, an absolute blessing from the policymaker. Uh, uh, second, you need trust, you need credibility. Um, it goes without saying. Um, uh, towards the end of the Clinton administration, it's become abundantly clear towards the end, because of decisions the U.S. was taking, uh, some of the Arab parties didn't trust the U.S., didn't trust positions that we were putting forward. Um, and you've got to maintain trust. An envoy sunk without trust. Uh, three, and I don't want to make it sound all, you know, kind of, uh, I don't want to dumb it down, but expertise. Uh, now, an envoy doesn't have to be an expert and a, what, what you might call a lifer. A lot of people work on this issue their whole careers. It doesn't have to be a lifer on the Arab Israeli peace process. But an envoy needs to have expertise uh, that an envoy carries sort of in the, in the luggage. You need regional expertise. There were moments uh, of high diplomacy in the, towards the end of the Clinton administration where you had not a single person in the room who had served or had deep experience uh, with Arab countries. Arab countries that were not only in the negotiation, but that were critical uh, outside the room. Um, but you need regional expertise. You need legal expertise. You need people who've got a military and security background. Um, it's just, it just it's astounding. What, what, what's most astounding from these interviews we've done is that the cross-cultural <coughs> element uh, is so important in diplomacy. And it's kind of a no-brainer for a lot of people. Even me at the Institute of Peace, I should know it since we've published a nine-volume uh, se nine series on how other countries negotiate and the importance of, of the cross-cultural dimension. But the cross-cultural dimension, it's absolutely imperative. And an envoy can't go into a negotiation, an American envoy, particularly these kinds of high-stakes negotiations where they're so accustomed to high-level U.S. engagement and they'll be so di dismissive of it if they sniff something wrong. You've got to have the cross-cultural aspects down um, or else you're sunk. And then lastly, I would say, and here the, the lesson is really more focused on the Bush administration, an envoy uh, needs to have a full menu. An envoy can't be a security envoy only. An envoy can't be an economic envoy only, Jim Wolfenson. An envoy can't be an intelligence envoy only, uh, uh, George Tenet. Um, uh, uh, Dennis Ross, when he went out to the region, for the most part, would go out with a full, you know, with large, actually he packed light and told him, traveled so often, but he had a lot of baggage because he carried the political um, uh, weight with him. He carried economic uh, files with him and he had the security issues. He had it all. You can't chop an envoy up into little pieces and, and sort of focus them on a narrow functional issue. It doesn't work. And I think this notion of functional envoys, we've learned after uh, four or five years of the Bush experience, you actually gain less from it. Um, we can talk about it more because one can understand the theory behind why they may have gone that route, but it certainly uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work as well as an envoy who's got a full menu. Um, the third and fourth uh, lessons, uh, one on <coughs> policy planning and one on Congress in the domestic dimension. Uh, first, policy planning. It's the, it's the holy grail of diplomacy. So again, it's not a novel view, but uh, you have to constantly emphasize the need for policy planning. The need and the importance of strategizing. It's rarely done. But one of the people we interviewed I spoke to, I alluded to before, this next steps syndrome, uh, where almost all the cables that go back and forth between posts in the Middle East and between the envoys and the White House and State Department, it's about where the Secretary is going to visit, and how do we use the UN General Assembly opening in September, how that fits in, and when someone visits Washington, who do they get to see, and that, it takes up like 80% of the time. I mean, it's unbelievable. And who's focusing on the substance? The process trumps the substance. And the process over substance issue has come up increasingly, um, and I don't know if it's a generational issue, if some of our predecessors in the period that Sam Lewis and Ken Stein were writing about, where envoys would often go out, and sure, they had the phones and all that, but they could often sort of exist in their own element. Now, that generation is over, and, and envoys out there, and everything's reported real time, and diplomacy, like everything, 
in this room, including Thomas, moves a lot faster. So you've got to get out of the next step syndrome, and you can't let, let process trump, trump substance. Um, lastly, the issue here, the elephant in the room, as I said, Congress and U.S. interest groups. Well, we, we haven't finished our work, so I'll give you just a couple of preliminary thoughts. But one is that uh, the role of the Congress, whether it's fueling uh, a reconciliation and moving Arab-Israeli talks forward, or whether it's a hindrance, I think much of the discussion is overblown. Uh, Congress and its role in the Arab-Israeli uh, dynamic uh, uh, can sometimes be what I would call a tactical constraint. But at the end of the day, presidents get what they want. And when it was President Clinton trying to offer economic aid to Palestinians, and he had to deal with METFA, the Middle East Peace Facility, this long, convoluted act that the Congress passed, which put a whole series of restrictions. At the end of the day, he always got what he wanted. He always had the money he needed for Palestinians. Maybe the checks were sent through someone else, but he could usually work around it. And there were waivers when the Congress said Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, and the Clinton administration felt that would upset the negotiations and start to build the embassy tomorrow. There was a waiver. And that president and this president used these waiver authorities. Sometimes they're tactical constraints, but at the end of the day, the president prevails, and it's not so different in a lot of other foreign policy issues. And if there's something uh, to engage on, if there's a major agreement or a major breakthrough, the Congress will follow through. Uh, so I think some of the discussion is overblown. Um, but I'll give you with one, of course, one caveat. We're still trying to sort of fine tune our conclusions, but uh, there certainly is um, a valid argument to make that in the period we're looking at, since the publication of this study, that the political price in Washington and American politics for touching uh, the foreign aid issue for trying to put greater conditionality onto aid, uh, particularly aid to Israel. Um, the political price has gone up considerably uh, since the first President Bush ran into some trouble um, uh, with some advocates uh, for Israel here inside the Beltway over uh, loan guarantees. A lot of you know the issue, certainly know the episode. Um, and then also, at the end of the day, we have a difficulty as, um, you know, as analysts and scholars uh, and some of the group as former diplomats trying to draw conclusions in, um, in finding the right methodology to measure this, it, this, this the role of Congress. Because often what you're looking at, and here this is a problem that afflicts everybody who studies the Congress and the role of Congress in foreign policy, what you're often looking at is an issue that hovers, sort of hovers in the air over people's heads. You're looking at judgments that weren't taken by policymakers not judgments that they took and failed up, but decisions that they didn't take because they were concerned about what scholars often call an anticipated reaction from the Hill. So it's a very murky issue which presents all kinds of methodological problems. Uh, we're going to weigh in on it, um, uh, but I think people might end up getting disappointed that we're not, you know, it's not the big bad Congress, um, and it's not the Congress or the source of all ills on the Arab's road peacemaking. So that's, um, it's funny to talk about early harvest because it's March or mid-March. Um, and things are just, I had one flower and I just bloomed at home. Um, I'd have to do it. But that's a little bit of an early harvest from a project, uh, a study group with five, uh, four of my colleagues, uh, one Georgetown, very enterprising Georgetown uh, research assistant, uh, where we, since October, met, met and sat down uh, for taped interviews with about 50 former negotiators uh, and uh, peppered me with some questions that helped me fine tune this. And then I also promised. Uh, uh, this isn't secretive. We'll have a document in a few months and everybody can read it. And if you don't like it, you can say so. And if you like it, we certainly would like to hear. <laughs> uh, so someone's got to shoot something back. I see, I see my good friend. Uh, <laughs> Stan, tell me yeah, what's on your mind. Okay. If no students want to go first, so no, I'm going to go first. Okay. Um, you're talking about Palestinian Israel negotiation. That's where you but I think there's now a new element, and that's Iran. Hamas, in particular, is now very close to Iran. And Mashal was just in Tehran again last week. The, the statement, I wrote one article in the Tehran Times, is very powerful. And it changes things, in my mind, in two ways. First of all, rejection of two states. <coughs> Ahmadinejad said, not really, we're going to recover every inch of it. I mean, I mean, I'm just going to intervene and push you for selfish reasons. You're asking how does the Iranian dimension affect the U.S. role? What implicate? Because again, my focus, just to be a little narrow and selfish, to sort of the U.S. role in the process. Okay. So do you want? Can we go in that direction? So how does that? What does that do for our role as third party? Because it addresses. This is the second point I was trying to make. You mentioned the balance of power. The involvement of Iran changes the balance. 
mentioned the balance of power between user and Iran. That's, you know, you could talk about a fairly easy balance. The involvement of Iran changes and we saw in the different And, you know, it seems to me you've got to factor that in there. What is the leverage? How can we meet it? If you have Iran being uncompromising and, look at, you know, and the effect on the balance. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, I think, and I didn't touch on it, but you, you know, you raise a great point, and I, and I suspect it'll come out in our study. I mean, the era of U.S. monopolization, you know, the U.S. monopoly over Arab Israeli peacemaking is, you know, it's over. It's, it's long over. And that's another thing that will distinguish us, and probably a fourth reason why we should uh, be reissuing the study, because it's just not the international or regional strategic environment that the U.S. that exists anymore. We cannot monopolize and be the sole party. Um, you know, at the height of, of Israeli-Egyptian peacemaking, it was great that we could monopolize it because it was a terrific wedge to kind of hold the Soviets out of the Middle East and diminish their influence. So it worked for a lot of reasons. It worked because it was easier. It's always easier to negotiate if you got one third party and not a committee of third parties. And it helped the United States strategically. Um, in fact, the, you could say in many respects the Israeli-Egypt peace agreement was the first post-Cold War uh, resolution of a major conflict, even though it occurred uh, uh, 13 years before the end of the Cold War. Uh, what do you do about Iran? Um, I mean, I think it suggests that the U.S. as the lead uh, third party needs to be doing much more in, a, in an environment like the one you described to work together with other third parties uh, and to sort of band together. You know, here I'm just, it's off the top of my head, but, uh, so I apologize for the lack of artful language, but the importance of the U.S. working with other third parties that's why the quartet maybe is a good thing, but maybe a quartet with a regional component is necessary. Why? Because you need to get the outside parties that support peacemaking to sort of form, to sort of circle, you know, the wagons, you know, circle the wagons, uh, so that you can both support the peacemaking and hold back the spoilers. Because if you're talking about what do you do about Iran, Iran's a spoiler, but you've got to find ways to neutralize the spoilers. And I don't think there's any way to do it uh, if we're monopolizing the process. So uh, it's, it's obviously going to be more complicated, as I said, Anytime you sit down and there's more than one mediator, you end up doing a lot of negotiation among the mediators, and that slows the process down. But I think all the, the only conclusion I can draw from your comment is that it suggests much more intensive U.S. coordination with other important outside parties, in this case regional players, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and in the international community. It's absolutely essential because this era of the U.S. monopoly is over, and we're not, you know, it's not coming back. Um, as you suggest, maybe we'll take it from a student. This is a university. <laughs> I've confused them all. Uh, Alex, do you have something? Um, I want to go back to the um, asymmetry of power that you were discussing earlier. Um, and how can we, I know we've discussed in our class last semester that the United States lets Israel get away with a lot. And how do we balance the power and level the playing field so that both parties get what they want out of something without sort of committing political suicide in, in the U.S. government. I mean, it doesn't seem like anyone wants to stand up and say we have to level the playing field for both parties. They don't be pro-Israel. Yeah, it's a hard, I mean, you, uh, I know it's, it's a very difficult question that you're talking about. How can a, uh, if an American uh, uh, political leader or diplomat is going to face sort of a domestic political, what's the incentive? Uh, I think there's artful ways to do it. It, 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 just, it. it speaks to the question of sort of what, and here we talk solely about the U.S.-Israel relationship, what kind of relationship serves Israel best? Do you, want, you know, do you want the U.S. to be Israel's bodyguard? Do you want the U.S. to be Israel's big brother? Do you want uh, the U.S. to sometimes speak to Israel on issues that are, that are difficult um, and that create tension, but ultimately help, and that's a judgment call. So for an American president to speak very uh, frankly uh, to Israel and to the Israeli people to do things publicly about, let's say, settlements, building settlements in the West Bank, until recently building in Gaza. Um, will you take some heat at home? Maybe. But, you know, depends on how you do it, depends on how you link it to a larger initiative. If you're doing it, you know, if you're bludgeoning for bludgeoning's sake, that's one thing. If you're bludgeoning, uh, you know, in retrospect, a lot of people, players in the region even, and it's amazing what you hear when you go and talk to Israelis about the Bush-Baker episode. In 1990, uh, at the time there was so much uh, animosity and so much bad blood, but there's an amazing amount of nostalgia because on certain issues, um, 
And this is, if you remember, because I drilled this in in class uh, quite a bit, on certain issues, and settlement building is one, uh, the dynamics of Israeli politics and Israeli society are such that they have an inability to address the issue. It's just, it can't be addressed on a national level. And, and I don't want to bore everybody with the reasons why, because of the crazy politics and the low electoral threshold and the role of small parties and the mythology of the pioneer. And there's all kinds of reasons. And you don't have to hear from me because you hear from a lot of Israelis that they just have a, they can't address it. So it's a, it's a perfect issue for a close, um, and, they're, and they're only going to take advice from a close uh, ally like the U.S. So it's a perfect issue to weigh in on. But how do you get around, um, you know, um, uh, the, the disinclination of an American leader to do it? Well, I mean, it speaks to leadership, and I think it also speaks to being a sort of a clever diplomat. If you do it just to sort of, you know, beat up on an issue, it's not going to work. But if you do it as part of a larger initiative, if you, you know, if you can link it to movement on a process, I think you get support at home and you get a lot of support in Israel. Um, other questions? One in the back. I'll do two at a time. One in the back and then one here. Can you state your name? I only do the first two questions. Thank you, Lon Weimer. I'm a graduate student. Yeah. And I have a question. Um, you've spoken about the U.S. letting Israel get away with too much, and I've talked of asymmetry of power. But my question is, are you ignoring asymmetry in the goals? I mean, this, the first question addressed the goal of, uh, the new goal of, or possibly not new goal, of trying to create, or, or denying a two-state solution and basically trying to create a Palestinian state on the whole territory, the whole area. And if that's the goal of one side, while the other side is trying to create a two-state solution, I mean... I, listen, I'm not going to disagree with you. We, you, don't, uh, you don't be an effective mediator by um, addressing and legitimizing, uh, you know, like what you discussed, rejectionist uh, uh, elements in the process. Uh, I talk about trying to speak, and other members of the study group here, we have a concurrence. when you. When you try to be an effective mediator and you try to address your intervention as a third party to that imbalance of power, you do it in ways that, of course, uh, 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 match up closely with fundamental uh, principles. And one of those is, a, is an agreed, negotiated settlement of two-state solution. I mean, that's a, you know, it's like a fundamental principle, and I'm not suggesting that should be. Uh, uh, now, a different question that you may ask is sort of how do you, as a third party, how do you handle Parties that are either in the process, like Hamas now is today, they used to be out, or when they're out of the process, they used to be out of the process. How do you handle rejectionists that have sort of walked, that have sort of, you're having a, it's not always a party, but imagine you're sort of, you're having your luncheon talk here, and suddenly somebody walks in who won't play by the rules, who screams and interrupts and throws vegetables at the speaker. Um, well, it's difficult. Uh, I would argue it's a separate, it's a separate subject, it's a separate time period, because we're not looking at the current period. I would argue you've got to find ways to use your leverage, like you're using now on the financial side. You've got to use it, but you've got to use it in a way that tries to bring a cautious, um, you know, a cautious, uh, conditional level of engagement. Uh, and you know, I would say, and again, it's not, it's not the focus of our study, it's in the later period. It's, it's, we're living it right now. I would say the no-contact policy, the very, very strict no-contact policy that the U.S. government has right now, doesn't really serve us well. I mean, it's like... Uh, because we have a lot of problems, and we're going to have this problem when we sit down at the table. And we've learned now, I think, from a long time, that uh, a long a, a period, not just in this region, but in other conflicts, the, if, you get, if you become too holier than thou about contact, you know, contact isn't a concession. Uh, agreeing to the kind of goals that you discussed, that would be a concession. No one's arguing that. So I would say we need to be a little bit more flexible, a little bit more um, at the edge, trying to sort of invite a conditional, uh, to, to test a little bit more. But you know, I'll take a buy. I'll take a. Um, I'll take a buy because it's not the focus of our uh, of our particular study. There's a question here in the front. Yes, please. Yeah, your name. Uh, I'm Francis Swiss. I'm from the University of Geneva. Um, I wanted to do a little bit more on the on the word Arabs here because for us Arabs means the things number one. All Arabs are Muslims, and number two, all Arabs are in the, the MENA region. So we are involved in this. No, let's say not African countries are involved in this process by all means. Um, for some time. Um, we have always believed, at least on the level of the grassroots in my country and in North Africa, that we should be involved in the process in the Middle East and in that region because some foreign countries, and uh, mainly the United States, wanted to put the emphasis on security. And then we followed this process for three or four decades, and all of a sudden we came to a stumbling block, which is the demise of the Cold War, and things have to change. And, uh, the, um, 
a few of the exceptions of the problems that we are suffering from now are the result of the involvement of these other countries and the country, someone that we So up to another level, the American administration came to the conclusion that certain things should change in the Middle East, in the Middle region, in North Africa, to move from security to transparency or to governance or to... Are you leading up to the question, how can you promote Arab Israeli peacemaking if you're also pushing for transformation and, and in the Middle East? Yeah. Well, I mean, I would argue, uh, I would take what I said was a lesson from the, Israel, from the small, the one inner core of the conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, dimension, about keeping that balance between peacemaking and governance, that you've got to address both, don't do one, not the other. I would just extrapolate that to the region at large. The U.S. isn't going to accomplish a lot in the region, I think, unless we find a, a balance between our own interests in security and regional stability and our, and our interests short and long term um, for a more transparent, open, democratic uh, politics in, 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 in countries in the Arab world that are more accepted and legitimate in our country. Uh, but you can't have it. I mean, I would simply just take my lesson and expand it out. And where the Bush administration probably had a little bit too, a little too heavy on the transformation uh, early on, a few years ago, you can see now they've recalibrated a little. And I think there's a bit more of a balance. And unfortunately, as we try to balance our interests in uh, both stability and, uh, and transformation on the, on the governance side, uh, we've recalibrated at a moment where our influence, unfortunately, has sunk to a very low point. And as, I, as I mentioned, sort of we're in a very unusual and a very dangerous situation where American power and American influence uh, are diverging. Um, here, Jacques lets me out. Uh, Jacques going to let me off. Okay, one more. I'll take, uh, I'll gather a few and maybe I'll try to string them all together. Here, at the table, yes, sir. My name is Michael Wazowski. The process, if you speak about them all, Presidents have opportunities to do a lot on Arab-Israeli peacemaking, and he dissects the four-year term. I think it's the first chapter of the book, uh, and the opportunities are more at the, at the earlier part than at the later part. Um, uh, and I think that's just sort of structural and we can't address it. Uh, what I would say is opportunities will always trump. So if the president's in the twilight, and there is a real serious opportunity, the parties are coming, begging on the door, help, that usually um, will win out over those those political constraints. Clinton parameters, I think they were terrific. I think the Clinton parameters should be reissued in a slender form. I could do it in half the number of words. And the U.S. should endorse it and get buy-in from critical partners. And we should have the U.N. endorse it. There should not be silence over how the conflict should end. I think the silence, the gentleman in Milan walked out, you know, the silence only feeds into those rejections who want to sort of dismiss the whole process. If there was clarity on what the U.S., the international community, thought about 
um, a negotiated solution on Jerusalem, all kinds of issues, borders, etc. I think it helps mobilize the moderates, and I think it helps marginalize the militants and the spoilers. So I, I'm all for clarity uh, and not for um, um, you know, uh, keeping things opaque. Lastly, the foreign aid question. I mean, I'm not going to talk about development aid. That's a separate issue. A lot of people don't like that USAID was wrapped into the State Department. I think it was a terrific innovation because at the end of the day, particularly on the Arab-Israeli front, we give a lot of money, we, we use foreign aid as a diplomatic tool for political purposes. We're not doing it simply to help people for humanitarian reasons. There's often a, a, a humanitarian dimension to it, whether it's with immigrants to Israel in the old days or whether it's a, a, a severe situation in the Palestinian territories today. The reason we give so much money uh, in the billions each year to Israel and its neighbors, it ultimately goes back to political purposes. And we have a political purpose trying to resolve and manage a, uh, a thorny uh, regional conflict. And I think you need to keep the political purpose at the core of why you do it. And there's no better way to do that than to have AID inside the State Department in our hub of diplomacy. Um, lastly, I'll just say stay tuned, because they're just my preliminary early thoughts. If you're interested, we'll have a, a document in a few months. and. Uh, Thank Melissa Stenz and Jocelyn and Vlad for letting me come talk. Thanks. Uh, folks, before we go, a few very, very brief announcements. I don't know if Professor Lieber had an opportunity to do so. We'd like to thank our co-sponsors today, our good friends in the Berkeley Center, our good friends over at CCAS, and I guess they're our good friends because they're not really an entity, uh, the National Resource Center on the Middle East, the Title VI. They are our good friends, but they're a different sort of entity. We'd also like to thank the Tunisian Embassy for sending a representative. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, tonight at 5 o'clock in Riggs Library, we have Professor Yossi Nouveau. But first and foremost, we'd like to thank again Professor Lissette.